Good evening uh, and welcome to this webinar presented by the IET's Cambridge Network. We represent members in the Cambridgeshire area, but we're very pleased to welcome uh, folks from around the UK and indeed across the world. Uh, my name is Phil Zangas, um, I'm the chair of the local group and I will be your host tonight. Now, uh, before we get to our speaker, uh, I've got a few housekeeping points to cover. First of all, uh, we will leave uh, questions to the end of the presentation. Um, and if you need to ask a question, uh, please use the Q&A button, uh, which you'll find at the bottom of the screen in the Zoom control panel. That's the Q&A button, please. Uh, we will try and answer all the questions tonight, but if we don't get to them all, our speaker has offered to answer those offline and they'll be posted onto <coughs> the IET Cambridge website later. We will be recording the event tonight uh, as well, so uh, you can find that on our YouTube channel if you search for IET Cambridge. Um, finally, I'd like to mention our next event, which will be on the subject of breath biopsy, that's diagnostics using um, breath uh, techniques, and that'll be on the 11th of March. Uh, and one last um, point, the IET has asked us to mention that they are running a survey uh, to understand and improve the representation uh, with respect to diversity uh, in the audience. And uh, I'll post a link to that um, towards the end of this event and there'll be a slide with the details on it uh, at the end. So um, let's move on to our speaker tonight. And I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Temok Rodriguez. Dr. Rodriguez is, uh, has a PhD in electrical engineering from Cambridge University. And he's worked across a number of fields in the aerospace, automotive and oil and gas field, um, mostly working on power control and uh, control systems. Um, he's currently principal uh, hardware design engineer with Ultra Electronics delivering uh, projects and solutions to the likes of Boeing and Airbus and uh, Mitsubishi Industries. Uh, Temok's um, most recent projects have included de-icing um, systems and door control systems. So um, it's with great pleasure that uh, I hand over now to Dr. Temok Rodriguez to talk to us about um, aircraft electrification. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Phil. Uh, and uh, I'll start by uh, giving thanks to the IT for organizing this event and allowing me to present this webinar tonight. And uh, I'd like to thank also my employer, Soltra, for allowing me to share some material that I've been putting together in the last couple of years with you. Uh, so let me go on and share my screen. Here we go. Uh, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll also extend my thanks to all the viewers. Uh, there's, there's a lot of participants to, tonight in excess of 300. So I'm hoping that the material that I will be presenting uh, to you tonight is of interest and, and you find it useful. And by all means, uh, get in touch afterwards uh, through the usual social media channels to, to discuss further if, if you wanted to. Um, so the material I'm presenting, I've been putting together over the last couple of years and uh, because the industry is slowly changing and adapting to the modern demands of the modern world. And uh, as it happens, I, I had all these material prepared a year ago uh, and, and I, I talked to the IET about presenting it. And at that point, COVID had not happened and we still had a lot of exciting uh, developments, new, new R&D happening in the aerospace industry. And I was going to talk about that. And then COVID happened. And, and unfortunately, that derailed things slightly in, in that a lot of companies have been suffering from a, a downturn in airline operations. And uh, as a consequence of that, uh, on the amount of money flowing around uh, aeronautical industries. Uh, but another thing that has happened is that the spotlight has shifted slightly from, from your usual big players 
to the newcomers uh, and those working in fully electric aircraft or, or hydrogen powered aircraft. So over the last year, I've been following what's happening and I've incorporated some of that material into the presentation, which I'm hoping you will, you will appreciate. So let's get cracking with this. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Ultra to start with. Uh, we had a large defense company uh, working in all sorts of, uh, of defense uh, fronts, from maritime to land uh, to aircraft. Uh, and I work in the Precision Control Systems Division where we look after our aerospace products. And we operate across uh, the world, mainly North America and the UK, also in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, just a few numbers there. The key th message I wanted to give is that we do put a lot of money into R&D and, uh, and try to adapt to the circumstances of, as we move forwards. Uh, within PCS, uh, this is the sort of product range that we, um, we design and then eventually manufacture products and, and, the, uh, and sell them to uh, the aircraft manufacturers. And we do both military and civil. And today I'm mainly talking about electrification on civil aircraft. And that uh, Jumbo jet that you see there has highlighted areas where we deploy our products, but they are all in high integrity, uh, electronics and software uh, that do either monitoring or control and relay that information to the pilots in the cockpit. Right, so why electrification and why are we talking about that now? And why hasn't it been, been done before? So there's your usual culprits, uh, global warming uh, and climate change and the policy that comes with it. Uh, we, we, we've signed up to the Paris Agreement uh, to reduce our carbon emissions by 2050. And then more locally, every country is coming up with uh, policies uh, to satisfy their, their, their voters, I suppose. Uh, and for example, here in the UK, we know that you know Boris Johnson has promised to uh, stop this, uh, the sale of uh, a diesel or petrol cars by 2030. Uh, so from that point on, uh, you will only be able to buy an electric car. Uh, similar policies are starting to ripple through to the aviation industry. Uh, we have examples of uh, Norway, uh, Sweden, where they are starting to uh, ban short flights within the country uh, as long as uh, there's a train route between them. Uh, so trying to encourage people to travel by electric trains rather than uh, short flights. Uh, fact uh, people may not be aware of, aviation only contributes 3% to uh, CO2. Uh, Despite this small percentage, there is an interest in trying to bring it down. Uh, and there's a lot of research across many areas from aerodynamics on how to make uh, travel more efficient uh, to fuels, synthetic fuels, mix of fuels uh, to try to um, pollute less and increasing the efficiency of, of uh, uh, jet engines, uh, turbofans and so on. Uh, so there, there is a genuine drive to bring that percentage down. Now, the other thing that's happened uh, that we didn't have maybe five or 10 years ago is the improvements in battery technology to start with. Now, for those of us who remember, you know, the last 20 to 30 years of battery performance, you, you may recall your, your cadmium batteries or your nickel metal hydride and how long they lasted and how they performed in cold weather, for example, or in hot weather. Well, battery capacity has increased uh, steadily uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, you know, from the advent of lithium ion in the early noughties, we've seen it doubling in capacity uh, for, for the same volume. Uh, and similarly, the performance of electric motors has also skyrocketed. Uh, I have to say mostly because of uh, the activities around the, the car industry and their electric drives. Uh, and even within generations of electric cars, we've seen those, those electric motors improving in performance. So if, if you take the Tesla example, they started with a cheap and cheerful induction motor. And over the years, they've, 
they've abandoned the induction motor and they moved on to permanent magnet motors. And now they have the, the permanent magnet synchronous reluctance uh, motors, which are incredibly efficient. Uh, so we now have machines that can operate at very high power levels in a very small volume. And this, this combination have allowed uh, concept aircraft, electric aircraft that, that we've seen in the last 10 years and demonstrators that they have pushed the industry to, uh, to take this seriously and, um, and start designing aircraft for, for certification purposes and for passenger carrying purposes. So that's the, the backdrop. Let me talk to you about some of the projects and initiatives that, ha that are happening at the moment. It will roughly see projects, demonstrators, efforts around three types of aircraft. Uh, the red dot there in the middle around London uh, is, is, is a metropolitan area, what, what is normally called urban air mobility. Sometimes they call it advanced air mobility as well. Uh, but it's essentially using electric aircraft to travel within the, the, a small distance. So you, you can think uh, maybe landing at Heathrow and then taking an air taxi that will drop you at Covent Garden in just five minutes. That sort of, that sort of travel. Then we have the regional aeroplanes that need to carry more energy uh, to travel a further, a, a further distance. And we are looking at 100 to 300 miles. So London to Edinburgh, London to Dublin, London to Paris, Amsterdam, that, that sort of distance. Uh, this is doable off with fully electric aircraft. Uh, there may be other aircraft variants with, uh, with fuel cells and with hydrogen tanks that may extend that range further. And then we're looking at the long distance, uh, which you will see uh, later in the presentation is fair, very challenging in terms of uh, electrifying the propulsion. Uh, and inevitably we will rely in fuels uh, like hydrogen uh, for that type of uh, market. So what's, um, <clears throat> what started to happen towards the end of the noughties, beginning of, of the 2010s, uh, we've seen demonstrators and small uh, uh, trainer aircraft. So we, we know that NASA are building the X-57 there with a lot of uh, propellers for cruising and for takeoff. Uh, and they are investigating uh, the aerodynamics of, of the aeroplane, the performance of the propellers and so on. Uh, then we have uh, the demonstrator, not the demonstrator, the uh, trainer uh, designed, manufactured by PP Strel in Europe. Uh, and this is now available uh, and certified. Uh, and it, it carries the, the trainer and the, the trainee, so two, two people. And it's mainly just to learn how to fly. So still not, not about passenger carrying uh, aircraft. Uh, and then there's a few other uh, demonstrators like the Airbus e one about 10 years ago uh, and more modern ones like the Rolls-Royce Axel who are trying to break the speed of uh, electric aircraft, the record for, for, for the fastest aircraft. Uh, so that's all good. Then we are into urban air mobility. So these are initiatives that are now looking at transporting people uh, from, from hubs or between hubs or between Verity ports, they call it. Uh, and we have some front runners in this market. We have, we have German companies, Lilium and Volocopter, that are fairly advanced. They have a lot of investment. You know, they, they are in the hundreds of millions of uh, euros already invested in them. Uh, and they have prototypes and they are in advanced negotiations with uh, Munich uh, government to allow them to operate around uh, their city. Uh, with Singapore, uh, with the United States, and Lilium is planning to, to open a Verti port in Orlando. Uh, so they are fairly well advanced. This is, we are not no longer talking about fairy tales here. This is happening, right? And uh, you will see these aircraft uh, flying and transporting people in the next two or three years. Uh, then we have Airbus. You know, Airbus have their fingers in many pies and uh, urban air mobility is one of them. That's a concept aircraft. Uh, and they have done other demonstrators as well. So again, they, they are getting in the mix. 
Uh, the last two in that slide are American companies. Joby has a lot of investment as well. Uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's one of the front runners and we, we will probably see it flying uh, passengers very, very soon. Now, this um, initially when I talked about urban air mobility and regional, uh, some of these airplanes bridge the distance that they can uh, cover, as you can see right there from the range. And that's because they, they can, they have either tilt rotors or some sort of rotating mechanism that allows them to uh, transform from vertical uh, takeoff to forward uh, flight using wings and the aerodynamics uh, uh, to create a lift. And, and once they have this, those mechanisms, they can, they can reach a, a further distance. So that is the case of, of Lilium and Joby. Uh, and again, they are, they are targeting a different market, right? Now you may be talking about moving from Heathrow to Stansted Airport, for example. And there's a few more, and this is just a, a very short list. There are about 200 companies uh, investing in urban air mobility. It, it is going to be a big market. I, I don't think it'll be monopolized by Airbus or Boeing. I think we'll see a lot of new starting uh, start uh, startup companies, and uh, uh, and people that may you, you, your Teslas, people that have never been in the industry, will all of a sudden appear and take a large share of this market. Uh, and that may be, for example, Lilium. Uh, your, your incumbents like the Airbuses and Boeing's are, are not even featured here, right? Uh, and the business model is also different compared to the, the large Jumbo jets. Now we're looking at, at, at a business model more like, like aircraft, uh, like, sorry, uh, like cars uh, and the volumes associated with car making. Uh, so th and that, that's allowed a different set of companies to come up. Now, once we move into the regional uh, distances, there are fewer uh, initiatives, projects, and demonstrators. We, we've, we've, we've seen uh, efforts to, to put demonstrators together, but some of the more credible projects are, are, are shown there. One at the top is one of the most credible. This is an Israeli company with a lot of uh, capital, and they have operations in the US and in Europe, and they are planning to certify these in the next couple of years and is fully electric, uh, carries nine people, and has a fairly decent range as well. Uh, the second there is, is a, a UK project, uh, and, and it's a consortium. We have Cranfield University involved as well, and uh, we have uh, Britain Norman, Logan Air, and so on. It was a project called Project Friesen. Uh, and again, the, the idea is to come up with a demonstrator and an aircraft that can be uh, fully electric and, and can be deployed in, in the north of Scotland to uh, join islands. Right? It's an island hopper, essentially, uh, and joining the communities. Uh, recently, we've also seen uh, flights in the US and Canada. Uh, we've seen uh, a Cessna e-caravan uh, take flight from Moses Lake. And we've seen Harbor Air uh, flying in Vancouver. Now, once you start going longer distances, you, you need more than batteries, and I'll show you that uh, in the slides uh, later on. Uh, but it, it, you will probably need a, a hydrogen in some form, either burning it directly in the gas turbines or in fuels or feed them through fuel cells that then generate electric power to drive your electric motors. And there are some examples there, uh, like uh, Zero Avia, who, who have a, a fuel cell type of arrangement, or Faraday Air, who plan to burn it in a gas turbine that then um, charges the batteries. Uh, and then we have an initiative from the US with Boeing and JetBlue and Zinum Air, which is again, uh, burning uh, the hydrogen uh, in gas turbines and then uh, powering electric generators. Now, Faradair, uh, it may, may be worth mentioning, it, it is a UK endeavor, uh, and they are uh, based not far from here 
at uh, Duxford Airport. Um, yeah. Now, long haul is a completely different story. There's even fewer players there because now you're talking about big uh, airplanes. Uh, we know that Airbus recently received a lot of funding from the French government to investigate uh, powering the aircraft with hydrogen. And they have a number of concepts from burning the hydrogen directly in the, in the engines to running it uh, off fuel cells. Uh, we know in the US, uh, there's Wright Electric who've partnered with EasyJet to come up with a similar uh, architecture. Uh, and we'll see what happens. These are longer term projects. We will not see this flying in the next two or three years. These are more like 10 or 15 years. But it is good to see that someone is thinking about this and, and someone is thinking about how we are going to uh, make air travel sustainable and ecological. So at this point, uh, we've reached uh, poll question number one. You will see a panel appearing on your screens. I'd be delighted if you can uh, choose an option and then we can discuss um, what, uh, what uh, the results are. Now, the fourth option down there has a typo in it. It should say hybrid electric long haul. So if you don't mind, just if you choose number four, it's long haul rather than regional. Uh, let's give it a couple of minutes and then we, we can discuss the results. Hey Mark, I think uh, we have most of the results in now, so I'll yeah, let's have a look. End the polling. So you should be able to see yeah. the results now. Yeah. So I, I got the results. I don't know if people can see them, but it, it is um, thirty-five percent of the participants believe that urban air mobility will be there first. Uh, the next. Uh, as with 36% hybrid electric regional and very few people think uh, a long haul will, will happen or even 21% 20, all electric regional. And I think I, I agree with, uh, with the voters there. And these are not competing markets, right? We are talking about different markets with different companies and different business models. So we, we will probably see the all electric urban air mobility happening at roughly the same time as hybrid electric uh, regional flights. So really good, really good uh, results there. Thank you. Right, let's carry on. So hybrid aircraft. I've, uh, I've done some calculations about how much energy we need to move an aeroplane carrying a certain number of passengers for speed. A given speed and a given range, uh, and this is based on the amount of fuel that they consume, and they are, you can calculate how how much energy there is in the fuel and so on. Uh, and you, I've divided it very simply into three categories of small, medium, and large aeroplanes. And then I had a, a short route: London to Paris, London to Milan, and London to New York City. Uh, and you can see the energy requirements there: so from 10 megawatt hours to 400 megawatt hours, and then I have a narrow kind of showing or exemplifying at what point we need to consider going hybrid electric, right? So if, you're, if your energy requirements are about a megawatt hour, then you can go all electric and the batteries will give you that uh, energy density. It, it, yes, the closer you get to the 100 megawatt hour mark, the more you will be um, in need of a, a higher energy density fuel uh, like hydrogen. Now, when you have a hybrid aircraft, there's a number of ways you can, you can uh, configure your aeroplane. Uh, in this case, I'm showing a series hybrid propulsion where you have a gas turbine burning that hydrogen. The shaft then is coupled with an electric generator, which generates the power to uh, charge the battery banks. And there's um, some clever power management happening to route that energy uh, to the electric motors. Uh, some common themes emerging from electric aircraft are the need to reduce losses in a system. So we're, we're looking at very high 
efficiency components across all these powertrain. Uh, and we, yeah, and part of that effort to reduce losses means also operating at higher voltages. Now, for, for those familiar with electric cars, you will know your battery pack runs roughly at a, between 350 and 400 volts. Now, in aircraft, we are looking at voltages way in excess of that. We are looking at 800 volts, and even some concepts are, are looking at two kilovolts or three kilovolts. And the idea is that you bring your, your voltage up so that your currents come down and your losses along the distribution wiring comes down as well. And of course, there's challenges on, on, on higher voltages. Uh, and those familiar with, with um, power electronics and, and motor drives and so on will know that there's uh, power devices can handle only a certain amount of voltage after which it becomes really difficult to, to withstand. And now there's been advances in, uh, in semiconductor devices uh, uh, with, a, with wide band gap uh, um, transistors uh, like silicon carbide where we can now switch and manage um, voltages of 1200 volts, 1600 volts, 1800 volts. So it is becoming possible thanks to advances in, in semiconductor technology and that will make our power distribution across the aeroplane more efficient. Now, the other option is a, so this is also a series hybrid, but now I'm showing a fuel cell instead of the, the gas turbine. So again, it's in series because you have your hydrogen tank feeding into a fuel cell, generating electric power. But you can also have a parallel hybrid uh, propulsion scheme where you have your, uh, your gas turbines running the uh, as the engines, uh, but coupled to an electric machine that is bidirectional. So you can either power the machine as a motor and drive your, your fans, or you can power the machine as a, as a generator, taking energy from the shaft of the, of the fans, which is powered by hydrogen, for example, and then charging your batteries, right? And then you can have some clever uh, power management going on for takeoff and, and, uh, and landing. So for example, you could say uh, for takeoff, I want to reduce noise and I want to reduce pollution uh, because I'm close to the city. You know, you know, think for example, Heathrow. Uh, so I'm going to take off on electric power. So those electric machines will be running as motors. Uh, once you are airborne and you've reached cruising speed, I'm going to revert onto uh, gas, uh, turbine mode, my machines then become generators to recharge the batteries. And I can run those gas turbines at optimum speed because I'm cruising. Uh, so that is a sort of uh, philosophy. Okay, so next we have all electric aircraft. In this case, there's, there's no fuels carried or other than the batteries in there and the energy in the batteries. Uh, and we'll have an A number of battery banks dictated by the safety uh, regulations, uh, you know, a minimum of two, probably four, eight, who knows, uh, multiple battery banks to, to account for redundancy. And that energy, that power is then routed to your various propulsion uh, components. So it could be two, uh, two fans, two propellers, or it could be multiple in a distributed propulsion scheme. Uh, but it, it, in this case, now we need to manage where the battery banks go. Uh, will they go in the wings as we currently do with, with fuel? Or will they be distributed uh, through the fuselage and the wings? Uh, another thing to consider now is those battery banks will be running hot right, when, they are, when they are delivering high power, for example, during takeoff. So we now need to think how we're going to cool those down and the sort of heat exchanges we need with the outside of the skin uh, to, to, to exchange that, that heat. So let's talk about energy densities of batteries. W what does the picture look like? How realistic is this? And I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of skeptics about you know, can, can, can this really work? What do the physics tell us? Right, so I've got that table again, divided between small, medium and large airplanes and their energy they require. So if they need 
if they are powered from jet fuel, that's how many kilograms they will need. If they are powered by batteries using today's technology, that's how many kilograms of batteries they need, right? So, and it's 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 not going to fly, right? <laughs> it's it's a non-starter, uh, especially you know as you go to to the large airplanes. Um, so we need something we need something different, right? If we really want to make air travel sustainable long term, we need something radical. So what is happening in the world of battery developments? So we know we've doubled capacity in the last 20 years. Uh, our scientists around the world know, and you know, they, they are fairly confident they will be able to double it again in the next five years by incremental improvements to the to the um, um, the anode and the cathode and electrolyte and putting silicon into them uh, or making them solid state, uh, experimenting with different uh, materials and so on. Uh, but even, even once you've gone through that in five years time, 10 years time, call it, and we've reached, you know, fairly decent energy density, let's say 700 watt hours per kilogram, thereabouts, you will still need quite a lot of batteries. So incremental improvements are not going to cut it. Is there anything else there? Well, th 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 there is some promising technologies, and this is fairly early days and there's a lot of caveats involved and I, I will walk you through that. Uh, but there's something called the metal air batteries, right? Using, using lithium metal, it, it could be something else. It could be aluminium or it could be uh, nickel. Uh, but I guess uh, the, the vast majority of the literature talks about lithium, lithium metal and air uh, combinations. Now, from a physics point of view, the energy density of lithium metal air batteries can go between 3.5 and 11 kilowatt hours per kilogram. So that is compatible to jet fuel. And if you look at the large airplane there and its energy needs of 400 megawatt hours, you would need 114,000 kilograms of batteries. And to put it in perspective, a Boeing 787 currently carries 161,000 kilograms of jet fuel, right? So as a working principle, this is a starter. There's a lot of challenges. Yeah, we it's early days. We may not see these for another 20 or 30 years, who knows? Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, from a physics point of view, it works. So what is stopping us from doing this? Well, lithium, lithium metal, is is very 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 reactive you you don't find lithium in its pure form in in, in the environment uh, it reacts with oxygen and it reacts explosively uh, with oxygen and water uh, so as a starter the electrolyte which is normally based on gels or aqueous uh, solutions cannot have water, right? Because if you put water with lithium, that is going to explode and you don't want that. So it has to be solid state. So we're going to draw from all those good improvements in battery technology in solid state electrolytes and we're going to put it there so that we don't have water in it. Then we need to think about that interface between uh, the anode and the electrolyte and how we're going to stop dendrite growth growing through the electrolyte and shorting your battery. Uh, again, there's advances on membranes and all sorts of materials that can go in that interface to prevent that. Uh, and then on the other side, this now works as a, almost like a, like a, like a fuel. So you need, to, you need to provide it with a constant stream of air uh, so that the lithium can react with the oxygen uh, to form lithium peroxide. And, and that completes the the reduction on the oxidation uh, um, reactions in the electrodes. Uh, so how are we going to manage that air? And how is that air going to affect my cathode? Because right? I only need the oxygen, but that air comes with nitrogen and all the other uh, gases in air. And those may have a degrading effect on the cathode. 
so that, those are some challenges. All the challenges are that all mo most projects uh, happening in research departments have only been able to come up with cells that, uh, that can tolerate only a handful of charge and discharge cycles. So at the moment, they, they are a, almost a one-time use type of battery. So you charge it, uh, and then that's it, right? You use it once and you have to uh, recycle it after that. So a lot of effort has to be put into uh, making these, uh, these type of batteries rechargeable. There's the stability of the anode and the electrolyte, as I described. Uh, they are also uh, low, they have low uh, reaction rates. And what that means is that they are not good for power surges. Uh, typically, you have two types of batteries, those that are really good at delivering power, like your lithium polymer pouches. Uh, those are the ones that you normally see used in drones. They can deliver 30 times its rated current. Uh, and there are those batteries that, are, that have higher energy density, but lower power uh, density. So that means they store a lot of charge, but they can only deliver it at a, at a slow rate. So potentially we'll be looking at you know, high energy density combined with something else, supercapacitors perhaps, or other types of batteries, so that we can cater for the high power demand of a takeoff, uh, and then the high energy demand for long uh, distance travel. And all the prototypes built to date have fairly low efficiency. Uh, so the, there's, there's losses uh, in, in, the, in the electrodes and across the, uh, the electrolyte, uh, uh, and that's not good because it tends up to heat up the, ba the battery, right? And that is active cooling. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about the challenges on building a battery pack. Uh, so th this is this is already happening. This is the sort of challenges that uh, those uh, projects, uh, project teams are facing when designing battery packs. And, and there's a lot of material there uh, and learning done and lessons learned from the automotive industry uh, with some caveats, with some uh, disclaimers, if you like, uh, in that We've seen many fires happening in cars. And in a car, when a fire starts, your dashboard notifies you that something is not right. You can, you can stop the car, provided you're not in the middle of a motorway. You can pull over and get off the car and walk really far away from it. You cannot do that in an aeroplane. So if we are going to put battery packs in the air, we need to make sure that they do not catch fire in a way that it can propagate and affect the, 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 affect the flight or the ability of the crew to uh, manage the flight and land the aircraft. And it most certainly not damage, uh, not, not damage, most certainly not um, hurt uh, the passengers in any way. So the smoke is either, is also not allowed. Uh, so when you put all those constraints and requirements together, you can see that the way they've designed battery packs for cars is a good starting point, but is not going to make it for airborne applications. So you need to start thinking on, on those safety aspects. Uh, a second aspect is that of redundancy. Uh, again, it, in a car, if your battery pack fails, let's say there's an open circuit or something on those lines, and the energy becomes unavailable, uh, what will happen is that the car will come to a stop and, and you need to get off the car. In an aeroplane, that cannot happen, right? We need to have redundancy. And we must consider that a failure will occur at some point in the life of this aeroplane. Uh, so we need to have at least two battery packs. Uh, and at the bottom of that list, I have crash tolerance. Uh, this is another requirement. Uh, it, it, it happens, you know, aeroplanes crash every now and then, uh, less now than it did 50 years ago. Uh, 
and our safety levels are increasing every year, which is really good. But we need to design components that go in aeroplane to tolerate crashes to only to a point where uh, it allows the passengers and the crew to evacuate the aircraft. Uh, but you can start thinking about if you're carrying a lot of energy in a battery pack and that crashes, right? The last thing you want is that pack to catch fire and uh, hurt the passengers or the crew in any, any way. So it has to be designed in a way that it contains uh, energy for a sufficient amount of time to allow the, uh, the passengers to evacuate. Uh, the other picture I have there is, is a battery string. And it's about how cells balance within a pack. Uh, and what happens here is that not all cells are made equal. Uh, and even when a production, we characterize cells and we pick up cells that behave in a similar way, they may be slightly different and they may age slightly different. Uh, and what that means in, in practical terms is that the energy available in a battery pack is sometimes dictated by your weakest link in a battery string. Uh, so then you need to start looking at, well, how, how do I ensure that when I charge a battery, you know, you say you're a hub, you're charging your, your, your battery. I want to make sure that all the cells in the string are at the, the maximum capacity possible. So that when I put in an aeroplane, I know that aeroplane has the maximum energy possible in that pack. Uh, and that's when we, co we come across with uh, ba uh, battery balancing. Uh, and what that means is that we look at individual charges in cells and we make sure that if some are charging faster than others, we kind of keep them discharged until the others have charged fully. Uh, so that at the end of the, of the charge cycle, you can show that you've kept those that are charging fast because of slight difference between them. They, they are not limiting the amount of energy that you put into it. And eventually, once the other, other cells catch up, you've ended up with a full charge, if you like. Right, lastly, uh, this is about charging. Uh, and uh, you know, in the electric car industry, this is very mature. That there are standards on how to charge vehicles, the types of uh, plugs, the amount of power that, that you can get, uh, and a similar thing will happen with aeroplanes. Right? I, it then it, it then becomes a matter of which type of aeroplane are we talking about? Is it just your, your two passenger trainer, uh, or your general aviation, you know, for leisure type of air, aeroplane? Uh, that you want to fly between strips or land in a, in a farm field somewhere. Uh, so where are you going to carry the charger and how much uh, power can, can you pump into it? Uh, and, you know, as with electric cars, we, we have a number of options. We can do a battery swap. Uh, these may be convenient for, um, for fast turnarounds. Say so you, you arrive at a Heathrow or something like that and you don't want to spend too much time charging, then, then you, you remove that pack from the airplane and you put in a fully charged pack. And then you take the depleted uh, pack into the hangar and charge it, something like that. Uh, it could be on board, uh, especially for uh, general aviation, small airplanes that may be attractive so that you can charge it from any electricity outlet. Or we can have very fast charges like we, we have for cars now where within 15, 20 minutes, you can get to up to 80% capacity, in which case you want all of that cleverness and, and power management off the airplane, right? Because you don't want to be flying with it because it's extra weight that has no purpose for flying reasons uh, and consume energy. So you want all of that power electronics, heat exchangers, et cetera, off the airplane. And now we've reached poll question number two. Phil, if you don't mind bringing it up. So hopefully everyone can see that now. Tenok, are you seeing that? Yes, yes, I can see it. 
So we're getting some good responses. So that's leveling out now. So uh, I'll end the poll there and uh, you'll see the results in a second. Thank you. In 10 years, uh, that's, that's good. Vast majority thing. 10 years, potentially 15 years. I, I think uh, you know, my gut feeling is, is that as well. There's a lot of groups, uh, research groups working on battery technologies uh, and, and we've seen these increments over time. Uh, so it is, it is the picture, right? Around 10, 15 years time, we should have some high capacity batteries. Very good. Right, let's carry on. Uh, let's talk a little bit about propulsion. Uh, so we have a lot of good motors out there used in, in, in cars. I, I'm pretty sure someone's fitted a Tesla electric motor into an aeroplane. Uh, uh, <laughs> and why not, right? Uh, again, that is a starting point. Now, the thing with aeroplane motors is, again, safety and redundancy uh, in addition to performance and weight. Um, so we, we, we are looking at very high power density, very high torque density, dual coil, coils for redundancy. Now, the advantage that we have in aeroplanes compared to cars is the operating range, right? It, it is more narrow because it needs to power the, the propellers or, or the fans compared to the range that you need in a car for, uh, for, you know, for, for the speeds that it has to cover. And we've seen new companies uh, appear in the market like Magnix and, and, and come up with beautiful designs of, of machines powering propellers. And in this case, uh, you can see there their, their 500 watt uh, motor that comprises of two, two rotors. You can see there are two sections and each rotor uh, has its own stator and each stator has two sets of coils. So you're looking at four sets of three phase coils powering two rotors. And that gives you a lot of redundancy, right? If one set of coils goes down, then you still have three sets of coils. Of course, that would be a degraded power mode. So you, your power levels will drop. Uh, but again, that, that is just the redundancy that we need to think about when designing aeroplanes. Um, the two rotors, again, if you have a failure in one, you, you have your second rotor. Uh, th there are some common elements that the shaft will be common and they, it will probably be designed to very high load levels with a lot of safety margin in it so that there's no realistic single fault happening to that common shaft. And, and that's how, you know, that's the general philosophy around aeroplanes. If you have a, a, a single part that could affect the flight of the, of the aircraft, then it has to be designed to very high levels of, of integrity. Uh, we have a, a UK company, uh, Magnix is American, Yasa is, is from the UK, uh, and they have, a, again, a very elegant uh, machine design. This one has uh, axial flux, that means uh, the magnetic fields and the, the, the gaps uh, and the magnetic field through the gap is, is running in the axial uh, direction compared to the more conventional radial direction. And uh, this is a type of motor that you see mounted in the Rolls-Royce Axel demonstrator. Uh, and I'm sure we will see it also in other aircraft in the future. Uh, and and you, can, you, can, you can build them up. So th this is a single section, but if you put three of those sections, you have three times the amount of power and it gives you your redundancy as well. Then we've seen uh, uh, designs from Siemens, uh, again, using the, the dual coil three phase configuration with a, for a permanent magnet uh, brushless motor. Here I've highlighted the hold back array, which is the same type of magnet array uh, used in the magnets. Uh, and what that means is that it, 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 it's a, all the magnets are in the surface of the rotor, which means you don't need much iron in the middle of the rotor, which means you can reduce the weight of the machine. And that's how these guys have managed to achieve very high power densities. Just eliminate all the iron that is there in the middle. And this whole back array configuration allows you that because the magnetic field stays kind of in the perimeter of the, of the interface between the rotor and the stator. 
there are more examples of UQM. Uh, and this one is interesting. This is only a concept, uh, again, from an American university. Uh, they've uh, they've uh, created a startup company. And, and this is a, a 3D printed electric motor uh, using additive manufacturing techniques. And what's uh, really cool about this is that they managed to print the conductors of the, of the stator coils in the layers building the, the motor. Uh, together with all the iron needed to to conduct those magnetic fields and uh, at least on paper these guys claim a very high power densities in excess of uh, 10 kilowatts per kilogram mm -hmm. uh, which would break all records right uh, uh, all the machines we, we i've showed you earlier are all around three four five uh, kilowatts per kilogram the, these ones doubling it so if these guys manage to actually build one <laughs> And, uh, uh, and make it reliable, they're going to have a lot of success. Uh, now, dual coil, three phase, uh, for those uh, that are familiar with power electronics, this is what it would look like. You have two independent three phase bridges powering independent coils. Now, if you synchronize those bridges, you can have the same current flowing through the phase A, B, and C. And so it, you know, for all intents and purposes, it would look like a single drive onto a motor. Uh, of course, if our health monitoring system detects there's a failure in either the coils or the transistors, then we can deactivate and, and, and isolate that part of the, of the drive and carry on driving the motor with only one, one bridge at a half power level, which again, when designing an airplane, we would ensure that that airplane can safely land with half the power. So you know, it could be that like just bring it down in a controlled manner. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about propulsion is uh, is distributed propulsion. Again, a picture here from NASA showing sort of crazy principles they are thinking about. So th this is a blended wing because the fuselage is blended with the wings and it has distributed propulsion at the back. So a lot of uh, fans at the back so that if one fails, you still have loads of them uh, running. Uh, and, you know, the clear advantage is, is the, the level of redundancy that you'll get, but they are also exploring uh, the aerodynamics, right? In this case, again, this is an extreme, uh, but in this case, you have the laminar flow going over the fuselage and the blended wing going into those fans at the back, right? And, and generating quite wide stream of thrust. Uh, so again, that may prove to be a more efficient aeroplane compared to what uh, we currently uh, perceive uh, uh, you know, as a two-wing aeroplane. A little bit about power distribution. Uh, that, that's your conventional electric uh, distribution. Uh, assume, I'm assuming here all electric, but essentially you have at least two uh, buses for redundancy purposes, uh, and they have as isolators all over the place, contactors, and they have ties as well. In case one fails, you can isolate the failure and then route power from the other bus, and, and that way you maintain your high integrity in your aeroplane. And eventually you feed that to your electric motors, so you can feed from either of the buses. Uh, in, in those concept aeroplanes with loads of propellers, there's another architecture that has come up now, which is having multiple battery packs, with each with its own distribution uh, system and its own uh, motor and propeller. And the idea here being that if one fails, you simply turn off all of that powertrain because you still have n other powertrains uh, powering your aircraft, and there wouldn't be a need to tie them together which makes your architecture simpler. Some challenges uh, about high voltage is obviously the, the insulation and high voltage. Also at high uh, altitude, uh, it's easier to create arcs and break over. Uh, so you have to you know, use the right uh, uh, coatings and insulators and so on. 
Uh, and there's a monitoring of high voltages uh, and switching of high voltages as well, right? But as I said, with, with the advent of uh, silicon carbide devices, it's becoming easier to, to handle. Uh, a little bit about electric loads. Of course, now say you now have your fully electric aircraft, the last thing you want to do is put a hydraulic system there to power your landing gear or you know, use a pneumatic system to de-ice your wings. Uh, so you want to go full electric, right? Uh, to, to make your architecture simpler, your design simpler and more elegant. Now, what we've seen uh, in the last uh, generation of, of, of uh, uh, passenger carrying aircraft is that Boeing and Airbus have already started considering electrification of, of their loads. Uh, in this case, I'm showing you what they've done in that they maintain the hydraulic systems for the control of the what they call primary flying surfaces. The, these are the, the, the moving surfaces that keep the airplane in the air. So you're talking your ailerons, your elevators, and your rudder. And all the secondary moving surfaces, they've now electrified. And that's your slats, your flaps, and your spoilers. Again, these will build them uh, a track record in the use of electric actuation and uh, a pedigree. Uh, and once they're happy, and depending on the reliability of these items, and most likely in the next generation of aircraft, they will go fully electric across all flying surfaces. And uh, instead of using a hydraulic uh, cylinder, now we're looking at electromechanical actuators where you have a motor and a transmission that changes that rotary motion to a linear motion. Now, one of the key he things here is how to cope with failures, right? Well, what if your transmission fails and it gets stuck? And we don't want a flying surface being stuck in a certain position that will spoil your, your maneuverability. Uh, so we need a mechanism to decouple mechanically that, that failed EMA from the rest of the mechanism so that your redundant EMA can take over and uh, actuate the, the flying surface. So that, then we come across clutches or other types of uh, linkages that allow us to disconnect an EMA. And uh, convert a rotary to linear, we, we have this type of um, a mechanism. So we have uh, lead screws, ball screws, or roller screws. Uh, Roller screws are the most efficient uh, and more, um, they, they transfer uh, the, the rotary to linear thrust uh, more evenly and smoothly. Then we have the motors and there's a, a wide range of motor selection from, from uh, brushed motors to brushless, which is probably the most uh, popular. Reluctance motors that don't have permanent magnets in them can be used for high speed applications like driving uh, pumps for coolants, for example. And obviously the, the higher efficiency motors like the synchronous permanent magnet motors for your heavy loads. Yeah, we, we can think here a uh, landing gear, for example. And we drive them through power electronics. Uh, and once we have electrified it, we, we can also put a lot of diagnostics into it and intelligence and health monitoring and so on. And uh, I, I've recently been looking at electrifying a landing gear and uh, this is rough power of what we would need to, to, to move a landing gear. So fairly large amount of power for a large aircraft, but not so large, for a, not so much power for a small aircraft. Uh, we've seen electric systems also in the braking, uh, for, for example, the 787 a system designed by Safran. Again, they, they abandoned the hydraulic system because it can catch fire when the brakes get hot no one likes the system, so they've gone electric, and that's proven a real success. Uh, then there's pumps, cooling fluids, and so on. Uh, let's jump that. Then there's ice protection, uh, and this is an area where we also actively operate at Ultra, uh, where traditionally uh, aeroplanes um, use bleed air from the engines and divert it onto the wings to melt the ice. And the reason you want to do that is because the ice, as it accretes, it affects your aerodynamics yeah, and your capacity to generate lift. 
so you want to keep that wing uh, ice free. Uh, and we, we have a, an electrothermal system, uh, which it comprises of you know, heating elements buried within epoxy and the, and, the, uh, and the erosion shield at the front of the wing. This is a cut view of how it would look like. So we have parting strip right at the front, constantly heating up and preventing ice formation. And then we have the ice heaters in the run back, you know, where the ice runs along the wing. And those are only turned on uh, every now and then. And their purpose is not to melt the ice, but to keep the surface wet so that any ice that accretes just flows away with a, with a stream of air. Uh, and in rough terms, this is what the, the wing cross section would look like. So we have our, our heating element in there buried in epoxy and then the aluminum or titanium erosion shield, the leading edge of the wing. Uh, and things to consider are, you know, the control of it. What, what happens if one fails? We want to keep flying characteristics symmetric across the airplane. So we would have to turn off the other side of the airplane to make sure that, you know, if ice accretes, it accretes in the same way across it, you know, the symmetry of the airplane. Uh, that brings me to the end. So very exciting times, uh, despite the pandemic, th there are pockets of activity and innovation uh, in those all electric and hybrid aircraft. And, uh, you know, most certainly we'll see those becoming a reality in the next few years. And the challenges always remain, right, with aerospace is always about safety. We need to make sure that those airplanes are safe to get on, they are safe to carry passengers. Uh, and then once that is taken care of, the, there are still technical challenges like how we handle the high voltage distribution and management. How do we cool down batteries and motors? And uh, lastly, how do we operate those aircraft? Right? Do we use existing infrastructure or there'll be new Verity ports and so on? And how do we integrate those with our existing uh, transport networks and so on? And of course, with another mega trend there on autonomous flying, uh, the likelihood of these air taxis being autonomous is very, very high because there'll be so many of them that I don't think it's realistic to train, you know, common people like yourselves and myself to be pilots. <laughs> so most likely you'll just get on it and, and tell it, you know, I want to go to Covent Garden and he will take you there. Uh, that brings me to Paul, question number three, please, Phil. Hopefully everyone can see that. Plenty of um, responses coming through. That's uh, leveling off now, so I'll end the poll and share the results. Yep. Yeah, so an important area of R&D is hydrogen fuel cells and electric propulsion. Uh, I, I agree with that. Uh, I, I, you know, like many people in the audience, I, I want to see air travel become sustainable and eco-friendly. Uh, and one way to get us there and maintain our, our long distance travel is to go into hydrogen. Uh, there'll still be room for the, for the smaller, you know, all electric airplanes. Uh, but I think, you know, to, to, meet our, our commitments with climate change and so on, we really need to be looking at, at these hydrogen planes. Uh, so yeah, very good, uh, very geared on. Uh, right, so that brings me, I think, to the end of my presentation. Uh, so we'll progress to Q&A now. Yes, thank you, Temok. Um, I'll hand over to uh, my colleague, David Blake, who will um, lead us through the Q&A session. Thank you. Hello, David. Are you? Um, are Sorry, you... I've, I've had a bit of a problem. My computer decided to do a, an update sort of halfway through. Um, I'm here now. Um, start video. Okay.
sorry about that. Um, sorry, apologies, everybody. I had a bit of a computer malfunction. Can you actually hear me, Temok? Okay. Yes, yes, I can. Good. Yeah. Uh, just let me try and um, get some of these Q&A up. Right, here we go. Right, we've got a wide range of questions. Um, and uh, I think you've answered a lot of these through the actual talk, which was very interesting. But there's one question here. Only, and although aviation contributes only 3% of CO2 emissions, isn't the effect bigger because of the high altitude damage in the ozone layer? I've read that it is. Uh, I'm not a, a, an expert in the field, but I, probably as, as a member of the audience pointed out, it, it probably is, yes. Okay. There's been quite a few questions about um, what you think of the future of batteries, which I think you have answered in your talk. But there's a comment that United Airlines have in fact recently committed two billion pounds to batteries for air taxis. Um, have you got any thoughts on the future of tech of batteries other than what you've already spoken about? Yeah, I mean, uh, United United are a, a progressive company that they. they they are investing in it uh, because they want to join uh, terminals in airplanes, in, in airports. Uh, so instead of having your shuttle, you will have your air taxi moving you between terminals, right? And in big airports like Heathrow or some in, in the United States, that makes sense. Uh, and if they are partnering, they are partnering with with air taxi companies. Uh, and you know, as the person highlighted, with battery technologies. But in terms of how battery technology progresses. It mostly it's been incremental. So yes, we will see a doubling of capacity in the next five years. Uh, and it may double again in the next five years. Uh, but as I said in the presentation, if we really want to uh, get to the, the longer routes, you know, the plus 300 mile routes, uh, we need a, 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 a disruptive change, something on the, on the lines of lithium air technologies. Okay. Um, how do you account for the commercial requirement to carry enough fuel in this case, battery charge to hold over a destination for 15 minutes. So in other words, when you're sort of floating around the top of Heathrow Airport, do you consider that issue? When you, you, you have to, you have to. Uh, so uh, uh, the way airplanes and airplane routes are, are, are designed today is that they have to, they obviously fly predetermined routes, but the routes are designed so that you're always near a landing place, yeah? it could be like an emergency airport or a military airport, and you're always half hour away or 15 minutes away from such uh, airstrip or airport or whatever, uh, and you need to have enough fuel to get you there. So the, the rules of operation will be similar for all electric aircraft. When, when you size the amount of energy that you put into your battery pack, uh, you need to account not only for, for your, the route you're flying, but for emergencies and diversions, right? And, and you need want to make sure that you have enough energy to take you to a safe place of landing. Okay. Now with, with air taxis and urban air mobility, all they're asking at the moment is the ability to land in an emergency, the ability to land that aircraft in a controlled manner and, and limiting the damage to, to property, right? So because they are smaller, you can imagine you can probably land in a football pitch. Yeah. Uh, so, so the requirement is slightly different, right? But the, the, the principle is still there. You need enough energy to allow a safe emergency landing. This is, so this is really even another bigger struggle for long haul aircraft, which presumably are gonna try and land at Heathrow. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. Um, it says here, will or are, are governments and in fact uh, manufacturers take into account the full life cycle of the aircraft with regard to emissions or are they any interest in the actual emissions created during the flight? In other words, what about the cost of the batteries, yeah. et cetera? Yeah, no, indeed. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think people are becoming more on board with, uh, with cradle to cradle approaches and uh, recycling of the materials. Uh, and we see it, we see it with the electric car uh, industry. We, we, we know that Volkswagen and, uh, and BMW will take their battery packs back for recycling and reuse uh, their the materials, the chemicals, back into new battery packs. Same thing with aluminium, right? We, we are looking at, at the whole cycle, life cycle of aluminium. Now, the, the question is also uh, um, what sort of energy goes into making those aeroplanes, right? So if we are jumping onto the bandwagon of becoming uh, fully carbon neutral, then we need to make sure that the energy that goes into making 
our eco-friendly airplanes also comes from clean sources. Uh, that's a much wider discussion. <laughs> you know, that, that is a country level type of discussion as to where do we want to go as a country, right? And, and where is our energy going to come from to power our industries? All of our industries are going eco-friendly, right? So it's not just aerospace. No. In, interesting issue here is why buy, burn hydrogen to generate electrical power? Surely this is less efficient than simply burning the hydrogen for motive power. Yeah, no, that's uh, not quite. Uh, you, if you if you burn it to generate electricity, you can optimize the design of your gas turbine to operate on a single operating point at incredibly high efficiency, and you just run it at that point, uh, and that just generates electricity. If you're burning it in 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 your turbines with your propellers and fans, uh, then you need a wider range and therefore their efficiency will follow some curve and it will not be optimum. Okay. There's several questions about the distribution or generation voltages. Are there any uh, standards emerging? Um, in other words, are the, are the voltages going to be dependent on the aircraft size or is this just something that people are sort of designing in on a ad hoc basis? I, I the, that's a good question. Uh, with many of these things, you need the front runners. <laughs> you need the front runners to, to decide what the voltage will be. But if, if you think about what we have in, in current aeroplanes, uh, we have a, a, a DC voltage of 270 volts, and that's that's written into a standard. And we have our AC networks uh, that run at 400 hertz on board aeroplanes, uh, and that's written into a standard. But the way you get there is by making aeroplanes and working with the authorities. So at the moment, it, it is being developed in an ad hoc basis and people are looking at optimizing their aircraft design. And you know, companies like SAE, uh, who define a lot of the standards that go into aerospace recommended practices, uh, will, will work with industry, right? And, and if they see that there are multiple voltages being used, they will try to accommodate. They will not try to make business life difficult for, for, for uh, pioneering companies. Uh, so at the moment it is, is, you know, it, it is looking high voltage, but some people are working at 800 volts. Some people are working at 1200 volts. Uh, I don't think there'll be a, a standard coming in the short term. It may, it may appear later in the longer term once the industry has settled. There's a general question by several people about safety being key in aviation and how much validation is being put into the battery powered engines and uh, the systems that are being developed? A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. It, it, is, it is, you know, all eyes on safety. Uh, it, there's been two incidents uh, with battery packs in concept aeroplanes catching fire and, uh, and being discussed to an nth degree in the media. Uh, er, er, early last year in February, the battery pack from a, um, what's it called, what's its name? Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, one of these uh, electric aircraft, uh, it, it caught fire whilst charging. And uh, luckily it was on the ground, it was charging. So I don't know, my, my gut feeling is that it probably overheated and it, safety mechanisms didn't trip. Uh, uh, an eco fire and, and the whole prototype was destroyed. It was a complete write off. Uh, and there was a, a, a similar incident on a on a Lilium aircraft uh, later on. Uh, and again, it, it was on ground, uh, probably whilst charging. Uh, so it is happening, and that, obviously that catches the eye of the regulators. Uh, and it's a lesson learned. And if anything, it will make their uh, safety. Uh, mechanisms stronger and more robust but yes it, 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 the, the authorities will not allow this aircraft to fly unless they are safe to fly okay there's, there's several questions which are sort of slight all slightly different but basically what they're asking is that uh, with a normal aircraft you know you're you you take off at a particular weight and you burn fuel and the weight of the aircraft reduces um What's going to happen with batteries where the batteries are still on the aircraft, for example? Um, yeah. You know, how, how do you reduce the landing weight? 
you don't. It, it is the same landing weight. Uh, so yes, it, it, it is one of the disadvantages, I guess, we compare with uh, traditional aeroplanes that get lighter uh, the longer you are into your route. Uh, but with all electric aircraft, uh, you, you, you land exactly with the same weight you, you took off. Okay. So presumably your undercarriage, et cetera, is of a more yeah. robust design than... Well, it has to be, right? It has to, it ha it, yeah, correct. It, ha it has to be designed for the, for the loads that it will land in, yeah. Okay. Uh, and just a small interesting one. Could you place the battery back packs next to the wings in such a way that Peltier modules, modules can be put in between to generate some more power instead of the excess heat being wasted? I didn't... From what I remember. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, Peltiers are not particularly efficient, but you're, you're scavenging energy. Uh, so yes, as a, as, a, as a starting principle, it could work. Uh, we we have to look at the details. I mean, there's there's a whole heat exchanger as well, right? They, they you, you need to keep your battery packs cool uh, because otherwise you, you have to disconnect them if they get too hot and you don't want that when you're in the middle of a takeoff. Uh, so you need to keep them cool. You need to exchange that heat somehow, uh, either by flowing coolant or air or some active method like Peltiers. And their location will be key as well. Uh, and you know, as this person says, if they are close to the skin, you can have some clever heat exchange there and recover some of that heat back into a good use. So yes. For the hybrid solution, there is hydrogen and ammonia competing as an alternative power supply. Why do you favor hydrogen, not mention ammonia? No, no it's a fair point. It could be ammonia. It, it could be ammonia. I, I just simplified my talk by saying hydrogen. But you, you could feel ammonia into a fuel cell as well, yeah. Yeah. There's questions about uh, evacuation of the aircraft and all sorts of things here. Um, but one of the, the things is the impact of the range of operational temperatures minus 50 at 40,000 feet to over 70 on the tarmac in Dubai. How, how will that be coped with? Yeah, with, 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 clever, with clever electronics. Uh, batteries don't like uh, wide ranges of temperatures and it's the same for cars. And uh, cars also have active heating and cooling. Uh, so the, the idea is that uh, you use some of the initial energy to bring the battery pack up to temperature, right? If it's if it's freezing, you want to bring it above zero, preferably to 10 or 20 degrees, right? Ha batteries are the happiest at around 20, 23 degrees. Uh, similarly, if it's too hot, you, you need to start pumping coolant and bring them down in temperature. Uh, and you have to actively manage that temperature to keep them in a happy region. Uh, so that, that's absolutely right. And, and unfortunately, that also means you will be consuming energy. <laughs> <laughs> in keeping them cool, which is not ideal. So that's where you know clever engineering comes through, and is how do you minimize your energy needs for cooling and heating uh, with you know clever designs of where you're going to locate these batteries and how you're going to keep them uh, temperature controlled. Okay, you mentioned radial field mo motors, and quite a few people have asked: Is do axial field motors offer benefits over radial field motors? Or vice versa. They, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's a good question. I, I'm not a machines expert. Uh, the, there may be there may be advantages. I would have to investigate. Uh, what I like about the axial flux is uh, is the slim form factor compared to the radial ones. Uh, so there may be advantages as to how you mount them into the, your your fans or you know your chassis and, and so on. Uh, compared to the radial uh, flux machines. Okay. Will electric aircraft be able to go as fast as jets? Uh, no, uh, they, they tend to go a, a bit slower, but I don't think that is a limiting factor from being electric. I, I think that's just the, the design point. Uh, as I said, you know, the, the concept Aeroplanes like the Rolls Royce Excel are trying to break the record for electric aircraft. Uh, is there? Uh, this is beyond my depth now. If there's a limiting aerodynamic factor uh, for these aeroplanes compared to uh, big uh, jet uh, power aeroplanes, so I'll have to I'll have to investigate that. Okay, 
Uh, and there's a question about, um, obviously there's a lot of, we've spoken quite a bit about uh, airworthiness and uh, the issue of uh, safety, et cetera. What about cyber threats? Is that likely to be considered at all? It, it is, it is. And uh, the regulators are starting to wake up uh, and uh, start rolling out a number of regulations to make even our current aircraft uh, more robust against cyber attacks. Uh, now, one, for those familiar with uh, technology in airplanes, some airplanes, especially the recent generation of airplanes, have a lot of uh, data being exchanged with the uh, ground bases. So for example, the, the Boeing 787 exchanges a lot of data uh, with, uh, with, with hubs. Uh, and they can not only monitor, but they can start uh, adjusting parameters. Right, so that, that's a real cybersecurity threat in that they could hack into, into Boeing's network and, and start controlling parameters in, a, in, a, in an airplane. And Rolls-Royce does the same with engines, right? And they can, they can tune the performance of the engine whilst it's flying, which is very scary, right? A, a real cyber threat. Uh, and the more we go into the future, the more uh, in, intelligence we'll build into these airplanes, whether it's conventional or, or fully electric. Uh, so yes, it, it is a real concern, uh, and we we are having to uh, design um, uh, firewalls uh, and, and the likes to prevent uh, uh, cyber attacks. There's uh, a question here, interesting David, one. Yeah, David and Temok. Um, well, we we've overrun a little bit, um, uh, and there's still lots of questions. There are. And I was going to just do two very quick ones, and then I'll I'll sort of end if that's okay. Indeed. Uh, the first one is, uh, it's really about the, the Cold War issue, actual fact. Um, winging ground effect aircraft, are they sort of being considered at all? Wing, wing ground wing effect, can you... These are where you have these aircraft. The Russians worked on them quite a lot um, for flying over their large lakes in Siberia, etc. That's just, and if it, it's a, a modern um, technology nowadays that people have been working on and whether they've in fact been powered electrically, but there's a couple of people interested in them. I, I, I wouldn't know how to answer that. I'm, I'm so sorry. That's no problem then. And then just to finish up, this is to finish up, what are the particular challenges in applying electric propulsion to helicopters? Yeah, uh, helicopters have, uh, have a swash plate as a single point of failure. <laughs> uh, and they, to come around that, they over design it and make it really, really strong. Um, but they are not considered a high, and they have a lot of reliability and maintenance issues. So when when the need arose to come up with electric air taxis, uh, I think electric helicopters were quickly discarded by 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 their nature. Right, even if you have counter rotating propellers to balance uh, the torques and so on on the shafts, uh, they are. They are less reliable than, for example, a a a, a four rotor uh, airplane, or indeed, you know, ten or eleven rotors, as we've seen in the volocopter design. Uh, so yes, no, I, I don't think helicopters are on the cards for all electric. Okay, thank. You. Well, that that's it. Can I just make a couple of uh, um, responses to questions? The first one is: if you need a CPD certificate, you email camsec at gmx.com. Um, and this particular presentation will be placed on our YouTube site, but it will take a couple, three days to sort of prepare it and load it up. I will make sure that everybody who is registered um, to attend this event and we have their email, um, I will email you to tell you when it is available. Along with the slides, there is a PDF uh, presentation available, which will also be put on our website. You will be notified if you are signed up and your email address is available. Thank you. Good, thank you, David. And thank you, Tamok. Um, fascinating and comprehensive overview for, uh, of what's happening uh, on the road, or, or perhaps I should say the runway um, to aircraft electrification. It, it might be a longer runway than, than perhaps some of us um, would like or, or hope for. Um, lots of uh, questions outstanding. And, and as, as we've said, um, Tenok has uh, very kindly said he'll answer those offline. So um, 
that brings us to the end of tonight's event. Uh, and I hope uh, you, Temok, and everybody else enjoyed the experience. Um, please keep an eye out for our future events, um, which you can find if you search for uh, IET Cambridge Network. So on behalf of the IET Cambridge Network, I'd like to uh, say thank you for joining. Uh, and we'll hope to see you all again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Tim. Um, Bye now. I will be closing the event now, um, but I'll leave you with um, a slide which shows the details of the IET's diversity survey, which uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and good evening.